Okay, it's Asia in Review. That means it's uh, 4 to 5 on Friday, and Bill Sharp is here. We snagged him. <laughs> and, we, and we love to snag Bill because he's a great guest as Fresh well as a great host. <laughs> okay, and, uh, but, uh, and we're, we're going to talk about uh, the, how well is Japan getting along with China because that, that you know, is connected to so many other issues in that region. Uh, Bill Sharp of Sharp Research and Translation joining us here as guest in Asia in Review. Welcome to the show, Bill. Thank you. Nice Thank to you. see your smiling face, Thank Bill. you very mm -hmm. much. Thank you. I'll catch up on, on tweets for a minute. Our, our Twitter address is, you know, ThinkTechHI, and we have some questions which we won't be able to answer, but we want to give credit for the questions. We have Gary Nakamura. He says, do you have what it takes to build a technology company in Hawaii? I'll find out today on Hibachi Talk. That's cool. And Dev League fav favorited a tweet uh, in which uh, Think Tech was mentioned. This is now we have uh, tech training in Hawaii, like, develop, like Dev League uh, coding boot camp. And there's more. If you want to uh, make a comment about, about Bill or me or about our discussion um, or, or ask a question, that would be better. Uh, you can uh, tweet us at uh, Think Tech HI. We want that. Anyway, so, um, you know, I got to tell you a short story. I went to China the last time, it was in uh, 2008, mm -hmm. and I, I, I was walking near Westlake. Oh, okay. This was a very nice, great, interesting place. Uh -huh. This is Shangri-La, a small Shangri-La hotel there, which uh -huh. I understand has uh, been updated since I was there. It's a big deal now. Um, and there's a walking path along Westlake, and I was walking, and this Chinese fellow comes up to me, and he says he, he wants to practice his English with uh -huh. me. Okay, and he starts going off on the Japanese. Mm. And he's really ticked. Off. That's what he wanted to talk to me about. Yeah. He's really ticked off about the Japanese. And, and uh, there, was some, there was some fights in a soccer match. Do you remember? Yeah, I do. You know, in, in the context of a sports yeah. altercation. Yeah. Uh, this happened in China. Mm -hmm. uh, and I said, whoa, you know, maybe the government's involved, maybe not, but there's certainly a lot of heat here mm -hmm. and this guy should approach me and you know go on and on about how he didn't like the, the Japanese talking about the war you know mm, talking yeah. about the rape of uh, what is it Nanjing, Nanjing mm -hmm. and all that fresh material mm -hmm. and I said mm, they got to get over this yeah. uh, so it's still alive and that was what seven years ago and it's still alive now and it's probably even more alive in that this is the 70th year after marking the conclusion of World War II where it says the Chinese called Kanru Jiangzhong, which means oppose the Japanese war, or the anti-Japanese war. And I, I don't know, I find it a little frustrating to tell you the truth. Um, you know, the war is long over. I think we have a totally different Japan today than we had in 1945. I mean, Japan is clearly pacifist, it seems to me. Uh, Mr. Abe, uh, Prime Minister Abe, seeks to make um, Japan a more defense-oriented country. He's pushed ideas about collective defense, which would allow Japan to come to the aid of other countries uh, in, in certain situations. He's removed the ban on exporting Japanese weapons, which are very, very good. Um, but what has caused that? And I think one of the reasons is um, the rise of China. As China, Japan sees uh, the Japanese uh, Japan sees the Chinese defense budget increasing 10 or 12 percent per year. More assertive um, behavior on the that behalf must, of the that People's must be Liberation Army. Great concern to them. Um, capabilities with nuclear weapons. Uh, aircraft carriers. Aircraft carriers. One online and a couple more coming. Uh, abilities in space. Um, intercontinental ballistic missiles. Nuclear submarines. Uh, not only nuclearly powered, but capable of launching submarine launch ballistic missiles. And I, I, and I think in a way that, you know, Japan's a, be a little bit remiss not to um, watch out for itself a little bit better. And of course, there's North Korea, and, you know, who knows what North Korea is going to do. Uh, North Korea is a huge guessing game, totally unpredictable as I see it. Uh, and, and clearly, they've launched missiles into the Pacific Ocean that have gone over Japan, but who knows, some could drop in Japan. So. I, I think that the Japanese are well within the realm of reason to pay more attention to the defense efforts. Um, 
You know what's interesting, though? I, I want to raise a sure. movie uh, only because I saw it last week and it oh, okay. left an impression on me. Okay. This is a movie called The Woman in Gold, and it's uh, about a painting okay. by Auguste Klimt, K L I M T. Okay. Okay. Uh, and it, it was, it was uh, um, a painting uh, in gold of, uh, of a woman in 1907. Um, and it became very valuable, and it was stolen from a Jewish household in Vienna by the Nazis mm. in 1937 or 38. Mm. Okay, and um, it's a story about one of the members of the family of that household who later on was in the U.S. and found out about this. She didn't know at the time what happened. She found out about this, and she mounted a, a, a legal campaign to get it mm -hmm. back. And ultimately, this campaign wound up in arbitration in Vienna. And her lawyer, who was a real interesting character, this is all true, by the way, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, appealed to this board of arbitration in a public forum. And the most salient argument he made, which goes to your point, is that Austria is way different today. This, by the way, happened in just after 2000 sometime, 2005. Right. Or, Ten or something. Um, <clears throat> Austria is way different today than it was in 1937 or 38. Mm. Countries change. Right. Um, everything changes. And right. if you think they didn't change in the space of what, 60, 60, no, it's more. 70, 70 years, years since the end of the war. If, if you think they didn't change, you better look again because if they didn't change, on the surface, then they changed underneath, but you know they changed. So here we have, we, we too often, don't you think, we measure these countries in Asia and everywhere by, by recollections of what happened years ago. And in fact, Japan's a completely different country yeah. now than it was during the war. And right. China is also a completely different yeah, country. That's a very good point. Well, I think that, um, I, you know, a couple things is that. Um, by the way, I, she got the art back. Good. Just want to let you know. It, it, it's not to say that the Japanese don't have certain snooty attitudes towards China. In fact, I think it's fair to say the rest of Asia. They um, even today, I think twenty. You know, Japan's been in the economic doldrums since about 1989, and clearly since 1990. Um, still, I think there's some of that snootiness there. That well, we're better than you guys. You know, being other Asians and. Yeah, I think there's a little tendency of Japanese to look down on other Asians. I uh, lived in Japan for eight years, and I saw a lot of examples of that. Usually very nice to Hollies, <laughs> you know. Um, well, but, you remember the story. In fact, he sat in this chair of this fellow who, after graduate school in the U.S., he met a, a Japanese girl, and they went to live in Japan, and he gave up his American citizenship. Mm. to be a Japan citizen. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he went into, he wanted to go into a restaurant or a bar and said Japanese only. Yeah. You know the story? And, and uh, they wouldn't let him in. He said, look, I'm, I'm a Jap Japanese citizen. I'm as, as Japanese as anybody in this country. I'm a citizen here, look. And they said, sorry, it doesn't count. He went to the Supreme Court of Japan and he didn't really get uh, rectification on that. So point is that the, the, the Japanese see themselves as more than just a nationality. It, it's, it's all blood race. and bone. It's blood and bone, as I call it. It's, yeah. it's, it's ethnicity. And frankly, I, I mean, Japan has made a big deal about being, you know, um, we are all people of one ethnicity. Well, the Koreans do that, too. The Koreans might be just a little bit more extreme than the Japanese. Uh, and, and clearly, this hurts Japan in the sense that the Japanese population is dwindling. It would probably benefit from immigration, a uh, wider, more generous immigration policy. The bell curve is really low. They're not, they're, they're not having a lot of kids. Right, and, and, uh, but there's, that just goes against the grain of Japanese thought. Um, on the other side, trying to be, lay out both sides here, um, you know, it is true that a lot of Japanese culture came from China through Korea to Japan, and even like you know things that we think of quintess as quintessentially Japanese, like sashimi, raw fish, that actually was a culinary trait copied from China, or kimonos, right? We always think of that as being very, you know, very Japanese. 
and um, kimono is actually an idea that came from China. Uh, and so much of and the language, I mean the kanji, language, yeah, the kanji, yeah. right? Yeah. The, the structure of Japanese is quite different, but the use of kanji is, you know, they're not, they don't always mean the same thing in Jap Japanese as they do in Chinese, but, it, you know, reasonably so. Um, the idea of Confucianism, the emperor idea, but there, there are very distinct differences, too, uh, culturally speaking. Well, the Japanese, um, you know, the, the Chinese rule is into this mandate of heaven. If you're an emperor and things are not going well, then the people have the right to revolt. That idea never had any roots in Japan, right? The Japanese didn't accept that. Um, Japan was probably a more feudalistic society. You know, the warrior had a, played a great role in Japanese society. I think that soldiering played a greater role in Chinese history than maybe I was first taught when I first started to study about China. Um, but clearly, it didn't have the gravity that it did in Japan. Um, you know, I'd like to ask you about some other characteristics sure. now that you raised those. What about affinity to the West? You know, it's, or affinity may not be the right word, but uh, you know, an emulation of the West. Oh yeah. You know, so you take look at Japan in the year nineteen hundred. Yeah. Nineteen hundred. Uh, they were emulating the West like crazy. Right. Were, even they, earlier than that. Actually. Even earlier, yeah. right? Uh, the, the time that Admiral. Um, Perry, when Admiral they Perry right. opened uh, Japan. I right. mean, they, they were they they gathered around that and and built a uh, in some part a Western industrial society. Uh, right. Back then in the 19th century, it was pretty impressive. Right. Um, China didn't really do that. that. That's a very very good point. Uh, we say Admiral Perry opened up Japan sort of at the point of a gun, but <laughs> anyway, he opened it up. Uh, it's probably fair to call that imperialism. Uh, if one wants to be really honest about it. Um, it. It's true, Japan saw the writing on the wall, and they saw what was happening in China, and they saw what was happening in Southeast Asia, and they didn't want that to happen to them. So in um, 1860, right at the time of the U.S. Civil War, there was the Meiji Restoration. Now, Meiji means the Emperor Meiji. Restoration means uh, up until that time, Japan was ran by the military, so it was the re restoration of the emperor as a, the ultimate power, although I think it could be argued that it was still largely symbolic. But anyway, e Emperor Meiji sought to um, modernize um, Japan, and he used as a model of the West. Now, though, you know, there might be an interesting parallel here in, in Turkey, right, as the Ottoman Empire was falling apart. Atatürk, right? He sought to modernize Turkey, right? To make it a more powerful country, and he emulated to make it a, a Western lot country. of Western country. He emulated a lot of Western practices, democracy, uh, Romanized the uh, Turkish alphabet, and that kind of thing. And Japan certainly incorporated a lot of Western ideas: constitutional law, new university system, um, military system, that kind of thing. And and it went on to become the you know, a um, big power in Asia, at least up until the present. And we, I, you know, I don't think you could say it's the ultimate power by in Asia. By the time right World War, if not sooner, by the time of World War II, they were the leading industrial power in, in Asia. Right? That's true. That's they, true. They had it all. I mean, they had industry, manufacturing, telecommunications, right. uh, you name it. Right. A system of highways. I mean, it was all working for them. Right, right. And maybe it made them a little bit you know, too enthusiastic about some things. Um, but China, China hadn't gotten anywhere close to that. You know, there was this, um, um, I can think of his name, Fujikawa. Uh, he, was, um, he was the founder of Keio University. Keio University is, is very prestigious, Japanese private university, difficult to get into. And his whole idea was, hey, you know what? Asia, Japan has to leave Asia. He started this, what they call it, Dea movement. Dei in Japanese means to leave. Ah means Asia, so they are. And to amalgam, not amalgamate, but identify more with the West. And, and I think for some time that Japan has been on that. Now, in today's world, there's some argument that Japan would like to sort of reconnect its Asian roots, to sort of go back. Oh, what a great, what a great thought. We have to explore this further. Uh, it, but it is such a, you know, startling feature and so right. I think it's so right that we can take a break. 
Okay, that's Bill Sharp. <laughs> <laughs> Sharp Research and Translation here on Asia in Review. Bill is the founder of Asia in Review, and he's a great Co guest as well as a great host. Guy. <laughs> <laughs> and we're asking, you know, uh, how well is Japan getting along with China? It's a very interesting question and discussion. We'll be right back. Aloha, I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute and host on Ehana Kako, a weekly program on the Think Tank Hawaii broadcast network. Ehana Kako means let's work together. Think of the sad alternative, let's not work together. Here in Hawaii, with all of our diversity and the richness of the people, it's important for us to come together around issues on the, the basis of what's right, and what's good, and what's going to serve the common good. And that's what we try to do at Ehana Kako. Every week we interview movers and shakers, people in government, business, and other sectors of society to talk about how to create together a better government, economy, a better world here in Hawaii that can bless the rest of the world. I thank you for your attention to Think Tech Hawaii, and we look forward to seeing you every Monday, 2 to 3 p.m., on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. We're Ehana Kako, and we wish you well. Aloha. Okay, we're back, we're live, and, and Bill has made an extraordinary revelation that we, it was so extraordinary that we had to take a break to you know, <laughs> sort of factor it in. And uh, Bill's point was that at this point, you know, in the evolution of Asia and uh, Japan and China, uh, China would like to be a little more Asian. Japan. Now, Japan would like to be a little more Asian. Yeah, well, you know, clearly, I think it's fair to say there's a tussle for influence, a tussle for power going on between China and Japan. They both want to be number one on the block. Um, one doesn't really want to give in to the other. Um, and where this is going to go, who knows? Now, historically speaking, people have said the economic complementariness between Japan and China is quite good. Okay, Japan has a lot of things that China needs and vice versa. But the politics are always very troubled. Um, well, one might ask, especially I think a Western, well, couldn't they be, couldn't they share power? Couldn't they be cooperative? Uh, couldn't there be some sort of cooperative power, a distribution of power between the two in Japan? I just don't see that happening because I don't think that one wants to be subordinate to the other. Mm -hmm. And you know, what even makes this more interesting is now we're beginning to talk about the Asia Pacific region as the Indo Asia Pacific region. That's, that's a fair statement, yeah. fair expansion. Yeah. Right. And, and, and it makes sense. I mean, the whole area goes together. We used to sort of just lop off the subcontinent, but India is a player. And India wants great influence too. So these are the three players in Asia Japan, China, and India. But especially in Northeast Asia, um, you know, Japan and China uh, um, rival, you know, um, compete for power, compete for influence. I think you can see this in Southeast Asia because I think who controls Southeast Asia has a great advantage on controlling at least Northeast Asia as well. Okay. And, and we see, talked about, you and me, we, we talked about that before. Yeah, we did. And how the U.S. is a player. Yeah. But Japan, or rather China, is being very Akamai and strategic about dealing with Southeast right. Asia. And you see a lot of competition going on between China and Japan and Southeast Asia. Um, yeah, a lot. You know, Mao Zedong used to say, you know, he used to say in Chinese, Dong Fang Hong. I know it's, the What's East is word? red, right? Well... <laughs> I, I, nobody says that anymore, but still the concept is there. If you want to be the predominant power in Asia, you know, China, Japan, you have to have great influence in Southeast Asia. And they're both vying for that, you know, rather, rather strenuously, actually. But isn't Japan kind of losing, I mean, I think I heard this in your earlier comments, it's kind of losing ground here. I mean, for example, you know, Japan had a world a world superiority in, in, in machine tools, mm -hmm. you know, as good as what you find in Germany and all that. Oh, yeah. Electronics, they were yeah. the best in the world. Right. Fine tolerances, fine circuitry and design. Right. Um, and now, after I don't know, 25 years of, of, of copying um, American electronics mm. uh, and building factories that could get it out the door and 48 hours, that sort of thing. Right. China has all of a sudden emerged as a fine tolerance, 
fine design, innovative circuitry, all that stuff. They, they have a lot of talent. <laughs> And I mean, I don't know if you could say that they have exceeded, you know, prevailed on on on, uh, on on Japan, but they certainly are giving Japan a run for its money. I think there are, and certain technologies that Japanese still remain um, ahead of the game, and I think the quality of production in Japan is really good. I mean, the Japanese are known for quality, They're also known for high prices, really. Yes. But the way the yen, the U.S. exchange rate is, that that's been somewhat um, ameliorated. Um, but, the, the, you know, I, I know Chinese, they refuse to buy anything made in China because quality issue. Now, yeah. what's sold in the Chinese domestic market is different than what you see made in China export to other countries. A lot of those products are made in foreign factories in China. But I, I, I've seen so many examples of really shoddy Chinese products sold in the domestic product basically for Chinese. Yeah. And, of course, the problem always is fakes, 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 fakes. There's so many... That still happens. There's a lot of that in China, just an incredible amount. But here's the, here's the, uh, the most interesting point. The Japanese all. would never buy anything fake. That would be a total loss right, of right. face. It's, it's <laughs> against their religion. Yeah, right. But here's an interesting kind of way of looking at it. Is, uh, you know, of course, the, the Chinese have done remarkable things with their economy. Sure, there's no and, doubt and about it. And over the same period since way the you know, early 90s, the Japanese have lost ground on their economy. Yes, it's true. Uh, and uh, they haven't really regained it yet, yeah. uh, although well, you'd like to see them do that. Yeah. Um, the U.S. So certainly would like to see Japan become uh, re uh, regain some of its former economic yeah, influence. Yeah. And because if it keeps going down, obviously, you know, it's going to hurt them in the competition. Sure. Um, but hear this, you know, <clears throat> right now, China's having trouble with the banking system. China's whole economic system is rattling a little. I am. And, That's a very good point. Uh, and uh, this is different now, and this may reveal flaws that are long term, that flaws that may take hold and, and demonstrate themselves in bigger ways going forward. Well, I, I'm glad you mentioned this. You know, I, I was uh, called um, a, a pessimist the other day, but, you know, I think uh, a lot of my pessimism is r r rooted in reality. Um, if we look at Northeast Asia, if we look at Japan, South Korea, and China, these are all countries that wanted to, like, get ahead fast, you know, move ahead, move ahead, economically develop. And they took a lot of shortcuts on the way. Now, Japan had the benefit of being protected by the U.S. The U.S., any country that would say that Japan was in violation of some trade practice, the U.S. would say, hey, just blow off, you know, go away. These guys are our guys. We need them. And, and we, we looked the other way so long. But remember, too, that, as you said, Japan became an industrialized nation in 1860. Mm -hmm. it's, got, it's deeply ingrained in the national culture about making quality products, That's about good too. doing good industry yeah. manufacturing. I think there's no problem with Japanese manufacturing. It's superior. The Japanese mindset and the Northeast Asian mindset is really given to high-quality manufacturing if it's done right. But the problem is in the financial world, where there's a lot of shortcuts taken. You know, a lot of regulations have been obviated. Um, a lot of like stock market manipulation and that sort of thing. And all sort of like, well, because this will make us go ahead. This will make us go ahead. And what happened to Japan in 1989 to 1990? It imploded. The stock market crashed. The banks were not well regulated. They were doing a lot of things they shouldn't be doing. Look at Korea, South Korea. Now, I mean, I really respect South Korea. I mean, it came a long way. It took a lot of shortcuts, too. Look yeah. at the financial crisis. So when was that, 1997, Asian financial crisis? Yeah. Korea got hit hard because it obviated certain regulation and what you might call standard practices. And China's doing the same thing, OK? I mean, the, Jap the Chinese banking system, the Chinese stock market, I mean, China has so much government debt, it's in, it makes the U.S. look good. And a lot of people will always say, oh, China, my gosh, look at it. I mean, from an international perspective, looking at China on the outside and the role it's playing, you know, with its, you know, new Silk Road and Maritime Silk Road and uh, handing out money here, handing out money there, building this in Africa, building this in South America. I thought, gosh, man, PLA is growing by leaps and bounds. Exuberance. It's... You know, <laughs> it's irrational. It's irrational. And then you look at the domestic scene in China, okay? And, and, and 
yeah, okay, it has $4 trillion in foreign reserves, but it's got a lot of domestic problems. You know, a lot of cities are broke, a lot of provinces are broke. Okay, the government, I, I, I read this comment last week, I'm not quite sure about it yet, but in, um, a, a, as in state capitalism, a controlled co economy like China, the government can just print money, no big deal. In this country, when we print money, and I think we've probably done a little of that since 2008, we really know we shouldn't do that, but we've did it, we've done it, but I, I think that's been curbed at this point. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think that China is in for some pretty rough times. You know, there's one thing that came up in connection with the uh, Chinese, um, you know, financial troubles right now that, that was particularly interesting. You know, remember, they, they carry a certain amount of Russian communist thinking. Yeah, okay? there's still that state capitalist idea. Right, and, 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 and that we, the state, we can, we can pave over anything. It's the classic thing is... That's a really good... Jay, that's a really good point. That's if, a very, very good point. If the grass on, on the parade ground is, is dry and faded and brown, and the general's coming, what do you do? You paint Cover the grass up. green. You paint it green. And so the same thing with the problems in the banking industry in the last few weeks. You throw money at it. You infuse money at it. You prop up the stock market. Uh, they did all kinds of things that would never have been done on Wall Street because people would have seen them as, as phony. The U.S. government could never tell Wall Street people, look, don't sell your stock. Look, if you're an executive in this company and it looks like it's going to fail, then you've got to buy more of your company's stock. That just doesn't happen, right? I mean, capitalism has its sort of irritating points, but it's, an, actually, it's a pretty good system. Um, yeah, um, you, you said one thing just a minute ago, and I, I, I just the, lost my train of thought. The communist notion. Oh, yeah. You know where you can see this really clearly? I, I just came back from China last Sunday, and I spent about a week in the Northeast. Okay, this is the old Manchuria. Now, up until the time of liberation in 1949, this was like the industrial heartland of China. Because Why? Because this was controlled by Japan, and... It was all kinds of big Japanese investments there, steel mills, factories, this, that, and the other thing. And up until China reopened to the world in 1978, this was still a rather major bastion of the, of the uh, economy. But then after China opened, you know, you began to get all this development on the coast from, say, like, um, oh, let's say, like Shandong province down through Shanghai to Guangdong and, and that area. And the Northeast kind of got left behind. Well, Zhu Rongji, when he was um, premier of China during the Jiang Zemin era, he really tried to shake up the Northeast, right? And he took a lot of these big old state companies, which were heavily situated there, and privatized them, right? You know, he kicked a lot of people out of work, but this was to make the economy better in the long run. But still to this day, according to the economist, just not me, this, the idea of this big state capitalism exists there, and they just can't really move forward. They're locked into the old mindset that you just mentioned. Yeah. Terrible bureaucracy. Terrible. We don't have that here, though, Bill. No, no. Because we have breaks every 15 minutes. <laughs> we're not locked into anything. Well, we're locked into our breaks, I suppose. <laughs> That's Bill Sharp. <laughs> Sharp Research and Translation. We're here on Asia in Review. We're talking about how well uh, Japan is getting along with China. And we have miles to go before we explore all the issues around oh, hey, We'll hey, be right hey. back. Hi, I'm Chris Letham, and I'd like to invite you to come and watch my show every Wednesday at 3. I'm interested in a variety of issues that have to do with politics and our local business economy. And I'd like to bring on guests who like to talk about everything from technology to social media to what we can be doing to improve our environment. And so I'd like to invite you every Wednesday at 3 to stay and watch my show here with Think Tech Hawaii. And I'll see you there. Ted Ralston, folks, host of our show at Think Tech Hawaii called Where the Road Leads, where we talk about technology influencing the future of Hawaii. Technology, of course, is the art of solving problems. We always bring in interesting and informed guests who can see from different perspectives and different points of view how that future might unfold and how technology can assist us in getting there. 
So once again, join us 4 o'clock to 5 o'clock on Fridays. Uh, Ted Ralston, your host. And please, if you have ideas that you'd like us to address on this show or folks who you think should be on it, let us know. Okay, well, you missed out again because during the break, Bill came up with another revelation that I think we really have to explore. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is that uh, China, you know, is trying to be on top here. It's a competitive thing. Uh, China is the aggressor, if you will, economically yeah, and true. maybe in terms of public relations and messaging. Um, and one of the things that seems clear is that China wants to weaken the relationship between Japan and the U.S. So, Bill, why do you say that and what are they doing in aid of that effort? Well, I think that they want to do that because um, they, China wants to be the boss in Asia. Uh, and they see that as being an unattainable goal as long as there's this very strong relationship between Japan and the United States. Because let's face it, U.S. policy in Asia is based on this strong relationship with Japan. The U.S.-Japanese security relationship uh, is, is, is fundamental to U.S. policy in East Asia. And they're best friends. We're our best friends. We, we, we go back all the way to the war. We, all right. <laughs> it, it's, it's such a massive turnaround, you know, in the relationship. I remember there's this one Russian that said, you guys dropped, some Americans, he said, you guys dropped two atomic bombs on Japan at World War II and they love you. What's the story? I can't figure <laughs> it out. That's not work. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, you know, you mentioned the island issues. It depends on what side of the issue you are. And if you're on the Japanese side, it's the Senkakus. If you're on the Chinese mainland side, it's Daoyu, Tha uh, Daoyu Island. Okay. If you're on the Taiwan side of the issue, it's Daoyu Tai. So okay. you have your choice. <laughs> but... Um, the, um, not so much now, because I think that, that you know, a Xi Jinping has realized this is probably not a, a good way to go about things. Is well, he's drawn the U.S. into it. Did you see the thing about the admiral who was overflying that whole area, U.S. admiral? Oh, this is a little bit different than the Dao Yu oh, Island. different. So, okay. yeah, this, okay. this is a, a, a more southerly group of islands. But it's the same thing. It's the same <laughs> idea, isn't it's it? Same. Well, almost. No, no, it's actually a little different. It's... Um, um, where was I? Yeah, okay. So up until the time Xi Jinping came into office, what he, the Chinese would do, all kinds of Chinese agencies, Coast Guard, not the Navy, but oh, maritime this or fish and wildlife that, they would send their ships out into the area of the Senkakus and to try to get the Japanese Coast Guard to pursue them and try to create as much havoc and confusion as is in Frankly, the one theory was just to plain wear out the Japanese. And the second goal was to, the, knowing that the Japanese would probably seek greater American support on this, is to, to conjure up that um, feeling that, oh, we Japanese should have more support on America on this, you know? And that knowing that America probably wouldn't go too far on this. Uh, unless it really had to, this would create tension in the relationship, and this would be a wedge between the two countries. Well, that really hasn't worked. Um, that, that really hasn't worked. And, and the United States supports, um, uh, according to the Japanese-American Security Treaty, uh, the United States supports uh, uh, Japanese uh, administrative control over the Senkakus. It does, not cons it does not support sovereignty. It sort of leaves that issue open, but it, it supports administrative control. Um, so I, I think Xi Jinping is backed off on the uh, Senkakus. Um, you know, one thing I wanted to say is, um, I, I think you can also see this in Japan, uh, in, in China. First of all, a couple things is, if you read the Chinese press, there's all kinds of invective, uh, anti-Japanese invective in the press. Uh, one expression is chu ya chin mei, which means, okay, if you want to translate in a very colloquial way, cut out of Asia to suck up to America, <laughs> uh, and that kind of thing. And, and, and I, even language that's more pejorative than that it sort of says, well, you know, like um, um, the, 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 the the Japanese are really subordinating themselves to Americans, that kind of thing. And they try to conjure up a little feeling. They also try to conjure up <clears throat> kind of atrocious things in uh, China during World War II. Um, 
but still the government plays on those memories as sort of uh, to partly, I think, to solicit support for itself, to solicit support sure. for the it's party. it's political. Yeah. It's 70 years ago. Yeah. The I, whole country has changed. Both yeah. countries have changed. Although it bothers me, it bothers everyone that the, the politicians go to that particular shrine in Japan. Uh, oh, that, I have that to admit. so foolish to do yeah. that. I, you know, what's even worse than that is right next to that shrine, Yasukuni Shrine, which actually architecturally is a beautiful building, but the symbolism is not so beautiful. It's global. <laughs> yeah. There is a museum right next to that, which is re particularly repugnant. And suggestions have been made that, look, you know what? What you guys should do, you should take that museum and just move it some other place. Move it away from that shrine. Okay, and take those 14 enshrined Class A war criminals out of there. But ja Japan's not willing to do that. Um, now, I don't want to sound like I'm defending this, but I, I understand, I think, why they don't want to do this. Because, example, when Prime Minister Koizumi was Prime Minister of Japan, he often went there. Okay, for certain holidays to commemorate the war, and then he got a lot of heat from China and South Korea. Um, and, and and I think the reason he went there is because he realizes that uh, with lots of Japanese families who lost, you know, relatives in World War II, this is a kind of thing to do. Like Obama certainly could not avoid going to Arlington National Cemetery on Memorial Day or Veterans Day or something like that. And if you wanted political support in Japan, you at least had to make a symbolic move there. And when Kozu um, visit there, when Koizumi was prime minister, and now some people would disagree with this, but I tend to buy into this theory. The big thing he wanted to achieve was the privatization of the Japanese postal system. The Japanese postal system is like a lot of other postal systems in Asia, but different in the US. It has banking services as well as postal services and has huge deposits, huge savings, okay? And what Japanese politicians would do is they would raid the postal savings system like American politicians have raided the social security system. And this was adding to Japanese debt left and right. So Kazumi's idea was if we privatize this thing, we're gonna get the politicians' hands out of that, and we're going to reduce debt. But to do this, which is highly controversial, he needed a lot of political support. And I think that's one reason why he went to Yasukuni. Sort of yeah. Um, but it is particularly repugnant. On the other hand, I would say that a lot of um, the anti-Japanese war museums in China are fairly repugnant, too. I mean, China's got a case, but they ratchet it up to a propaganda level, which is well, I, I wanted to ask you about the they here. Okay. You know, we had a show earlier this week uh, with Michael Davis. Do you recall who he is? He's I saw a mention of, of it. Yeah. No, he's, he, he's had a lot of contact with, the, uh, with, with Hawaii. Uh -huh. And he was here physically uh -huh. in that chair. And uh, he's a public intellectual at the University of Hong Kong. Okay. He teaches law there. Okay. Um, and he follows very closely the, the relationship between Beijing and Hong Kong and the Umbrella sure. Movement. You've talked about that, I know, sure. on your shows. Sure. Um, but one, you know, one of the things that came clear in that discussion is that Xi Jinping mm -hmm. is much more aggressive uh, than uh, Hu Jintai. Uh, Hu Jintao. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Hu, Hu Jintao. Hu Jintao. Uh -huh. uh, and, and Xi Jinping is like fomenting unrest and testing the barriers and the, pushing the envelope and doing all these, you know, relatively speaking, these aggressive things for reasons that maybe you, you have to be a China expert to understand. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's got to be part of this. Uh, if you look at, at uh, Hu Jin, uh, Xi Jinping's um, strategy here mm -hmm. uh, of being aggressive and pushing people around and, and you know, competing w in more aggressive strategical moves, uh, one of those moves has got to be to push Japan and come out on top and show the Chinese people that you're the king of the hill, so they leave you in office and they don't question your authority. I, I think there's probably something to that. Um, when John Zemin was the um, um, first secretary of the Chinese Communist Party, president and also chairman of the, um, with the, the Central Military Commission, the ultimate power holder in China, 
uh, he was particularly anti-Japanese. He went to Japan on a state visit, and he, as I recall, he left early because he was making just too many incendiary statements, and it was a total flop. Well, Zhang grew up in Shanghai. Shanghai was bombed by the Japanese in 1937, and that was probably the beginning of his political career. He was a student protester and that sort of thing, and carry that with him the rest of his life. Um, yeah, you know, it's really interesting when you think about this, like um, some people say that Susan Shirk, who wrote a very interesting book a, a few years ago, maybe 10, 9, 10 years ago, but I think the thesis still holds true, China is actually very fragile. I, and we saw it in the stock market. and. Chinese are also good at hiding things. I don't know what else is hidden. That's going Painting to the on. grass green. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, she was also making the point that a lot of, of Chinese newspapers, right, they're actually, they're controlled by the state, but yet they have to make money, right? And so when they do anti-Japanese stories, they know the circulation and sales will just soar. And uh, on the other hand, uh, as he said, the government, uh, you know, they depend on a certain amount of uh, periodically injected anti-Japanese invective to solicit support for them. Um, it's, it's, an agenda. It's, it's, it's just part of the game. It's, um, it, I, I don't know, I, I'm sort of set back by a lot of um, Chinese comments I hear about the Japanese. So where's it going to go? We only have a minute left here. Where's well, it going to go? I mean, I, I would assume that Xi Jinping is going to continue to do this, continue to push the envelope to, to uh, what's the word, excite and, um, and uh, prom promote dissension, whatever, in order to retain his power. You know, here's an interesting point. Our guest, who was supposed to be here today, but because of her son's sickness, could uh, be here, that she made yesterday at the East West Center, is that if Asia is to really achieve the economic heights that it seeks to achieve, there needs to be a peaceful relationship between Japan and China. I think cooler heads know that. It's very interesting that if you look at some of the key leaders of China, Mao Zedong, Zhou Enlai, Dong Xiaoping, Chiang Kai-shek, they all aspired for a better relationship with Japan. Chiang Kai-shek, after World War II, was particularly magnanimous to Japan. He didn't want war reparations. What about Xi Jinping? Um, Xi Jinping, I think that it has to be, you know, we're, we're waiting for the jury to come in on him. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's where we leave it, Bill. We're waiting for the jury. He's got to be watched. He has a lot of power in this. He could go either way and get support. He can consolidate a lot of power. He can use it as a strategical agenda in so many ways. Hopefully, he'll do the constructive thing, but... We'll see, and, and when the next move ha happens to connect the dots, you and me will be right here, Bill. Good. Aloha, Bill. Aloha. Shesh, shesh, sajian. Sajian.